Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning to all our colleagues and friends uh, joining from Europe and North America. Uh, welcome to the ACR Impact webinar uh, titled um, Innovative Data for Monitoring Trade. Uh, uh, in this uh, webinar, uh, we will be uh, discussing uh, ADB's research using uh, AIS data in uh, understanding, discerning uh, trade patterns, and also to uh, produce meaningful statistics that could be eventually used as an alternative to uh, traditional sources. So uh, in today's webinar, our presenters are uh, uh, Ed Rias and uh, Cheryl Chico. And uh, first, we will be presenting the results of our analysis and studies. And uh, thereafter, I, we would uh, ask a number of experts from around the world who are worked with uh, AIS data to discuss uh, not only uh, the results of our research, but also to provide uh, further insights into how this uh, AIS data can be used uh, as an alternative sources for producing meaningful uh, economic statistics. So without further ado, I would uh, ask my colleagues, uh, Ed and uh, Cheryl, to uh, present our work. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, let me just share my screen. OK. So uh, good day, everyone. In this presentation, we'll be discussing how we made use of AIS data for real-time trade monitoring. So let's first understand what AIS is. AIS, or Automatic Identification System, is a tracking system for ships, which was originally developed for collision avoidance. Because ships emit signals of their location every few seconds, this allows for real-time geo-tracking and identification for vessels equipped with AIS. This signal contains information on a vessel, including movement and voyage information, and they are received either by a satellite receiver from space or from a terrestrial satellite receiver. So AIS is considered big data primarily due to its large volume. The International Maritime Organization has a convention called the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, which mandates vessels to be fitted with AIS equipment if, one, the vessel is at least 300 gross tonnage in weight, uh, two, if the vessel is at least 200, uh, uh, if it is a cargo vessel that is at least 500 gross tonnage in weight, or three, if it is a passenger vessel. So AAS messages sent by vessels are categorized as static, dynamic, or voyage-related. Static messages are information on the vessel's identification, including the MMSI and IMO numbers and the ship name, and also characteristics such as ship type and dimensions. Voyage-related messages include destination, estimated time of arrival, and draft. And finally, dynamic messages include position of the vessel in terms of latitude and longitude, speed over ground, course over ground, and navigational status. And from this rich source of information, we can say that AIS data provides a big data source that goes above and beyond its original application for collision avoidance. Now, the information contained in EAS meets the criteria of high volume, velocity, and variety. For example, AIS data provider Spire Global alone produces about 36 gigabytes of data daily. And because of that, traditional data processing tools are insufficient to handle the scale and complexity of AIS. Therefore, big data processing methodologies are necessary to efficiently manage and extract insights from AIS. Thankfully, we have access to the United Nations Global Platform, or UNGP, and through this platform, the UN provides access to AIS data to encourage the use of big data for policy applications. It provides a platform for international organizations, researchers, and statistical offices to collaborate on developing alternative sources of official statistics using big data. Um, historical UNGP AIS data is available from October 2018, 
And as of May 2023, there are around 4 terabytes of data consisting of 33.5 million records per year on the average. Each row corresponds to a position message sent by a single vessel together with a static message containing details on the vessel's identification, characteristics, and voyage. In total, the UNGP AIS consists of 49 fields. Now that we know the fundamentals and concepts about AIS and where we access the data for processing and analysis, we'll now share with you some of the key results of the KI supplement, which is our just-released publication. It demonstrates a methodological framework for deriving insights on maritime activity using AIS. So let's first discuss how we derived these indicators from the AIS data. Now, while AIS, being a big data, has an extraordinary volume of information, it does not explicitly give information on activities such as port visits, port congestion, and maritime highway traffic and transit. Because of that, we need to develop a set of techniques or methodology to derive such indicators from the raw AIS data. And here's the conceptual framework of the study. The task of deriving indicators can be broken down into two. First is detecting areas of interest or what we call the EOIs. And the second one is detecting the areas of interest or what we call the AOIs. So the events of interest or EOIs are specific maritime incidents or activities that are relevant to a target indicator. On the other hand, the areas of interest or EOIs are the geographic locations where such events occur. These two together help extract the relevant data points from which we derive the indicator. And just to give an, a simple example, consider an indicator on the volume of traffic in the port of Shanghai. For that, the events of interest would include all activities that vessels do in ports, such as the loading of cargo, refueling, anchoring, and so on. Meanwhile, the area of interest would be the boundaries of the port. And the ships that match this AOI, EOI profile will comprise the data set that may then be summarized into an indicator. Okay, um, now let's discuss more in detail this conceptual framework for the two cases of port and maritime highway or passageway. First, for the port, we classify the approaches to define the AOI into three, the manual, distance-based, and the cluster-based approach. The manual approach is the most straightforward one. So you could just perhaps draw an oval-shaped boundary, like you can see in the image here on the left, and say that, okay, this is the port boundary or AOI for this port. This could yield the most accurate AOI if done with expert input or if there's a high-level ground data available. However, this approach becomes more impractical as the number of ports under consideration rises. Because for example, if you're studying hundreds or thousands of ports all at once, it would be too tedious to manually draw the boundary for each one. So maybe in cases like that, the better approach would be the distance-based approach, which sets the boundaries of a port as a predefined distance from its center. And in this example, in the center, you can see that the predefined distance is 22 kilometers. However, no guarantee can be made over how accurate the resulting boundary will be. The 22 kilometer may be large enough to capture adjacent ports that you are not interested in or you do not want to include in your study. And also, the boundaries of ports may change over time due to expansions and closures. And then finally, we have the cluster-based approach, uh, which employs algorithmic techniques to set port AOIs. Specifically, boundaries are inferred based on the identification of clusters in AIS messages, and around that, a convex polygon is drawn to demarcate the AOI. Its advantage is that it sets port boundaries according to actual shape behavior, which is not only potentially more accurate, but also more responsive to port expansions and closures. It is also easier to scale up than the manual approach. But um, since machine learning is involved, computational resources can be a limiting factor. The specific machine learning algorithm we employed for the study was the uh, density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise, or DBSCAN for short. Now, ultimately, none of the three approaches are perfect for defining the AOI. The best practice is to use the approach that best suits the research question, the data availability, and the resources at hand. 
uh, and that's for the AOI. Now, for the events of interest or EOI's four ports, they are the entry and exit of vessels to and from the port and then the assortment of activities that vessels may do in port. Unfortunately, information on these activities is not readily available in AIS data. So we've simplified it to the act of a vessel being stationary. Okay, and then within those defined AOIs or boundaries, we obtained three indicators, the count of unique vessels, the count of arrivals, and the time spent in port. The count of unique vessels is simply the number of unique vessels that dock in a port over a given period. The count of arrivals is the number of vessels that have arrived in port at a specific time period. The difference between the two is that the count of unique vessels is the stock variable, while the count of arrivals is the flow variable. Uh, and the third one, the time spent in port, is simply a measure of how long a vessel stayed in the port. So with these indicators, we can see whether a port has an increase or a decrease in the number of ships visiting it on a daily, monthly, quarterly, or even a yearly basis. We can also see information like which specific days did vessels spend relatively more time in port. Now, investigating ports and deriving indicators from them is crucial because ports are hubs of trade activity. However, our interest extends beyond, uh, beyond ports to maritime passageways, especially critical choke points that can disrupt the global economy. Uh, vessels navigate these passageways to reach their destination ports, therefore complementing port level indicators for a comprehensive view of global maritime activity. The EOIs for passageways for a vessel's entry at one end and its exit at the other, while the AOI for passageways needs to be able to capture the transit of vessels. Maybe the maximalist approach would set the AOI across the whole of the passageway to track the complete movement of all entering vessels, but that approach is computationally intensive and difficult to scale. So a more strategic approach would be to set AOIs at key sections of the passageway, and for that we employed two approaches. The first sets, uh, the first approach sets an AOI positioned at the entry and exit points of the passageway, with boundaries determined by a cluster-based approach, uh, and this often includes anchorage areas. Uh, these AOIs offer accurate verification of vessel transit because they confirm that a vessel was detected in both openings and hence uh, they have transited the passageway. However, they might not be suitable for passageways with wide or undefined knocks. The second approach sets just one AOI at the narrowest point near the middle of the passageway. And the reasoning for that is that any vessel detected here can be uh, assumed to be in transit through the passageway. And the advantage is that having to monitor just one AOI is computationally more efficient. On the contrary, uh, disadvantage is that the AOI may miss the AIS messages sent by passing vessels as depicted in the scenario in the figure here on the right. You can see that the area of interest is this small rectangular box in the middle of the passageway. It is possible that a vessel passing through a passageway may miss sending a signal within the defined AOI and therefore the indicator will say that this vessel did not go through the passageway when in reality it did. So this could result in the underestimation of the indicator. And that is the disadvantage of this approach. Now, for the indicators for passageways, we also have three, the count of unique vessels, count of transits, and the median transit time. The count of unique vessels is just the number of vessels detected within an AOI defined in the narrowest part of a passageway for a specific period of time. The count of transits is the number of vessels that have transited the passageway, so those vessels that have de uh, that were detected in both openings of the passageway. And third, the transit time, which is the amount of time it took for a vessel to cross the passageway from entry to exit. Now, um, that's basically the methodology part. Now, let's take a look at the results, at the indicators we've derived for the port of Shanghai uh, as an example here. So the port of Shanghai is the largest port in the world located in the PRC. So first, for the count of unique vessels, it fluctuated around the 3,000 mark throughout the entire period, uh, and there are also significant peaks and dips. 
uh, you can see that the vessel counts plunged at the start of 2020, uh, coinciding when the PRC began locking down areas in Yubei province, which is the site of the first recorded COVID-19 outbreak. And we can also see here another lockdown associated drop in April to May of 2022, when the city of Shanghai was locked down due to a COVID-19 outbreak. It also appears that shipping had grown somewhat adaptable or more adaptable to these scenarios since the fall in vessel counts in 2022 was not as deep as that of 2020. And similarly, for the vessel arrivals, we can see dips during these lockdown periods. And also for time spent in port, we see slight increases. Now, this chart presents an annual summary of port activity in Shanghai. And in this plot, we, uh, the yearly number of arrivals by vessel category is depicted as indexed to 2019 levels. The chart makes the observation that merchant ships, which are cargo and tanker, were less affected by lockdowns than non-merchant and passenger ships. Indeed, arrivals for non-merchant and passenger ships in 2022 I saw the most significant drop from the 2019 level. Uh, we can also see here that fishing vessels continually increased with the highest in 2022, despite the multiple lockdown. Now, uh, we want to complement the port level statistics for the port of Shanghai with indicators on maritime highway transits. The relevant passageways for East Asia were determined to be the Straits of Malacca uh, and the Strait of Singapore which uh, together connect the East Asia with the Western Hemisphere. So just a bit brief background, each year about 90,000 ships accounting for about 40% of global trade cross these straits, uh, which makes them a vital maritime artery, not just for East Asia, but for the whole world. So the figure here, you can see the vessel transits through these straits starting November 2021. And uh, the Shanghai lockdowns did not appear to have much of an impact on the vessel transits through these passage passageways. And this speaks to the fact that they serve to connect more than just the port of Shanghai. Other ports in the region include Singapore, Busan in the Republic of Korea, and uh, Kaohsiung in Taipei, China. Also, the data indicates that there has been a steady increase in traffic through these streets. In Malacca, for example, daily traffic increased from an average of 230 in November 2021 to about 250 by June 2022. We also wanted to present the indicators obtained for the Suez Canal, which is an artificial sea level waterway in Egypt, and it connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. It's a popular trade route between Europe and Asia. In 2021, the Suez Canal was blocked from March 23 to 29 by the Ever Given, which is one of the largest cargo ships in the world. And these are the indicators for Suez Canal for the year 2021. The daily transit count is shown by the blue line, while the daily median transit time is shown by the orange line. The average count of transits before the blockage is 52 vessels per day, and this is like the business as usual case. But then we can see a sudden drop on March 26 to only 22 vessels, then drop again the next day to 17 vessels. And this seems to signal the fact that some vessels decided to reroute during the blockage. On the other hand, the blockage seems to have magnified the transit time from a median of 28 hours to 179 hours. But then it gradually decreased until April 7, which is more than a week after the every given was dislodged. We also explored the potential of AIS in capturing disruptions in port activity. One of those is disruption due to a disaster. And in this case, it is a volcanic eruption that happened in Tonga back in January 2022. The calculated count of vessels for the port of Nukualofa in Tonga shows a marked spike in the first quarter of 2022. And upon further investigation, of more granular AIS data, we found that this spike is attributed to the arrival of rescue-related ships such as helicopter carriers and naval ships in the port for rescue and relief-related operations. 
And then another disruption we explored was that related to war, which is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We investigated the port of Odessa, which is the largest seaport in Ukraine and also one of the largest in the Black Sea region. And aside from that, we also explored two straits that connect the Mediterranean Sea to the Black Sea, the Dardanelles Strait and the Bosporus Strait. The top panel shows that for the Dardanelles Strait, the number of vessels had been trending downward even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. For the Bosporus Strait in the middle panel, the number of vessels dry up, dropped right after the Russian inv invasion of Ukraine, but there was a prompt recovery afterwards in the next few months. The bottom panel also shows that there was a sharp decrease in the count of Phoenix ships, which coincides with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Although a recovery can be seen by the third quarter of 2022, the count of vessels is not yet back on the pre-invasion level. And then finally, we wanted to validate the indicators you obtain where data is available. However, their frequencies are lower. It's yearly, only for the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, and monthly for the Suez and Panama Canals, with some missing months for the Panama Canal. For all these comparisons, the calculated mean average percentage error or MAPE ranges only between 3 and 4%. So these are highly promising results that suggest that AIS-derived indicators can indeed complement officially published statistics without significant loss of accuracy. And um, we also compare the indicators we obtained with other data providers from the website called My Ship Tracking for the Port of Shanghai and Marine Traffic for the Port of Rotterdam. Although there are discrepancies, we can see that the magnitude and trend are very similar to each other and therefore is an implication of the potential of AIS data. The notable discrepancies seen here are likely due to differences in methodology, given that the same fundamental data is being used. And as mentioned earlier, Defining port boundaries is non-trivial since different approaches can potentially lead to very different results. And uh, just to conclude, we can say AAS data is useful to generate reliable indicators of maritime activity. And we acknowledge that AAS data is not without its data quality issues, but these are outweighed by the potential benefits for policymaking and research over traditional data sources because of its timeliness and comparability across time and economy. And in line with that, uh, AAS should be complemented with additional information from trade statistics economic indicators, and port-specific data to fully contextualize the economic and trade implications of observed trends. And that is all for the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Ed and uh, Cheryl, for a succinct uh, presentation of our study as well as the results. Uh, let me uh, introduce our panelists. And first of all, uh, let me thank you, uh, a uh, uh, big thank you to all our panelists for joining from Europe. You all have to, uh, uh, it, it's, it must be quite early there. Uh, so our panelists are uh, uh, Justin McGurk, uh, Geospatial Specialist, uh, Irish uh, Central Statistics Office. Uh, Nelly uh, Vander Whelan, uh, Statistician, Irish uh, Central Statistics Office. Uh, Gabriel Fuentes, uh, Assistant Professor, Norwegian School of uh, Economics, and uh, Jasper Wershu, uh, Postdoctoral Researcher, uh, University of Oxford. Uh, once again, thank you very much for uh, joining and uh, uh, agreeing to review our work as well as providing your insights uh, uh, on the topic. So my first question uh, is to Justin. Uh, given your extensive experience in this field and also in using uh, AIS data for producing economic statistics, um, what do you think are the significant challenges that need to be overcome uh, to harness AIS data for uh, statistical purposes? Uh, what do you just do? Okay, uh, thank you for that. Well, firstly, for statistical purposes, you need to be able to guarantee or at least give some sort of um, comfort to users that your outputs are, are, are reasonable and concur with other data sources. So part of our process in developing our internally was to, to check with our existing official statistics to see if it matched with 
um, the trends there. But secondly, the first thing you probably really need to consider is I fundamentally identifying what the question that you need to ask is, and it's going to be an iterative process because there is a massive amount of data in there. And so by considering very carefully what your research question is, you can then start developing and start thinking about what is the essential data that I need because something that's sort of, when you're getting into the tens of millions of records, the, the, the sheer weight of observations begins to provide a, a very serious overhead for calculation. Um, so you're always looking for shortcuts or data minimization to reduce the amount of data that you use and fetch in processing. So that would be probably I, what I think would be one of the key observations, I would say, is, is sort of thinking about how you can reduce the actual amount of data that you ingest, process, and use, and always be thinking about what are the computational overheads. Because, say, doing something like a distance-based calculation on an individual couple of points, that is a trivial calculation. Even into the tens of thousands, it's reasonably trivial. But when you start getting into the millions, it just will not scale. So you need to be thinking about how any sort of processing can scale up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. Um, uh, certainly uh, quite insightful, and uh, we will be relying quite a lot on your expertise as we move forward with our work. Uh, my next question is for Nelly. Uh, given that the Irish uh, Central Statistics Office has already uh, integrated uh, or experimented and as well as integrated the AIS data into the official statistical processes, uh, and, and given your experience, uh, what are some of the issues uh, that need to be overcome and addressed um, uh, in integrating an a, a big data like AIS into official statistical uh, production process. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for the kind introduction and for launching this report, because we at the Central Statistics Office in Ireland are actually really excited that we can now use IAS data for the production of official statistics. Um, I'm the CSO transport statistician, so I'm coming here as an expert in the topic matter of transport and not as a methodologist. But it was so important for us to venture in the use of IAS data because especially in the COVID-19 pandemic, we and you all saw that we need timely data. And working for a central statistics office, it was very important for us to find more timely data sources to ensure that we stay relevant. And that is really in guidance with UN um, principles of fundamental statistics. So for us, it was really important to explore how can we more, be more useful to stakeholders and policymakers giving timely analysis. So as our chair just said, we already published as the Central Statistics Office in Ireland a frontier release where we showed that indeed using IES data is really promising and we can produce results which are very similar to our official statistics. As Justin, my colleague, um, already said, it is very important to validate and benchmark the data. So we were able to show that using IES data shows a very similar trend to our official statistics. And now, a year later, I'm really pleased to say that the CSO will be publishing early economic indicators using IES data. So we really believe in the value of IES data and the presentation showed very well that was given this morning how close IES data are to other data sources. But as I said, a year ago, we published a frontier release. Only a year later, we are now able to produce frequent analysis with this. And this really shows the lot of um, difficulties that we still have is in embedding big data into official statistics. You have to think, for example, about the fact that using big data in official statistics is very new and novel. It's different at universities, for example, or in the private sector. But as the Central Statistics Office, you are the trusted source of quality data. So we have to ensure that we can produce reliable statistics and also ensure to our users and the public that we can produce official statistics with big data and that it is not a black box for users. What is these big data? They're hard to visualize. So this was a really big burden. We had to adjust our quality processes in order to publish with big data because it just didn't exist in our central statistics office before. So there were 
really some key lessons that we learned that you have to work with topic experts, you have to work with methodology teams, but also you have to work with your quality team and change your generic statistical business model in order to publish from these new novel data sources. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nelly. Um, so certainly uh, quite uh, useful uh, work that has been done at the Irish uh, Central Statistics Office. And as you know, uh, many of our countries, uh, the developing member countries of ADB, which are island nations, um, have uh, faced serious challenges related to traditional, the collection and compilation of traditional stat, uh, data, data sources. So we hope to rely on uh, alternative sources like AIS to produce uh, uh, more timely and high quality uh, statistics, economic statistics for policy making. And uh, we will certainly be relying on your expertise as we move forward with this initiative. Thank you. Um, so let me uh, move on to the next panelist, uh, Gabrielle. Um, you have done uh, some pioneering work uh, on the passageways uh, using AIS data. And uh, in this report too, we have attempted to uh, uh, understand the uh, traffic flow through passageways and uh, see if that can be connected to the to the statistics related to trade. Um, what are your insights uh, on and views on uh, the usage of this uh, approach uh, to monitor trade as well as to uh, support uh, for policy making? Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So uh, first of all, I, I try to think of an analogy when I try to think about passageways. So let's consider passageways to be, or let's consider trade by sea as some sort of network of streets connecting different locations for A, port, port to B. And then these passageway, passageways could be considered the streets where only few cars, so to speak, or vessels in this case could pass at a time. So in short, these are the bottlenecks of the network. Naturally, if you want to interpret the health of uh, the different trade routes, you will focus on these bottlenecks and identify whether there are issues in theirs or not. And given that these, these are relatively small spaces compared to the vast ocean that surrounds that, then you very easily can collect a lot of information in a very short space and with with relatively short uh, AIS positions. The important part as well is that we have uh, identified so far that uh, these bottlenecks could send ripples across the networks. A clear example of that, the blockage of the Suez Canal for six days by the Ever Given, uh, we observe ripples and uh, delays in places as far as the Shanghai port or Rotterdam. And uh, that uh, emphasizes the importance of uh, monitoring the monitoring monitoring these uh, important uh, trade lanes. So, my other insight is that this data, and you mentioned that as well, given that you could produce timeless statistics, then decisions could be made in the moving in the making, such that while a decision maker identified that there's something happening within the network, then they can a recourse in any sort of decision that they have made uh, at the beginning. One example of that, the Panama Canal is recently facing a immediate pressure due to restrictions based on water levels on the lakes of the canal. A ship owner observing vessels piling up at the canal entrance could take decisions in terms of either having some transshipments uh, within the United, United States rail uh, network or even transshipments on ports uh, within um, Close port from the canal. A new element has come into in, into factor as well. Um, operational efficiency that could be derived from a statistics is no longer a matter of uh, cost reductions or um, income generation, but it also becomes a matter of emissions control as well. So nowadays, given that the stringent regulation, more stringent regulations are coming for the reduction of greenhouse gases from ships and terminals, ship owners or our port uh, operators could use this data as well to make informed decisions as to be more efficient vis-a-vis -vis reducing the emissions of their operations overall. The advantage of the AS derived statistics overall, and this is a key point in here, is that information generated from passageways, passageways almost in real time, is advantageous compared to the traditional set, that, which is official statistics that may be derived weeks or even months after the occurrence of a, a, a shock within the network. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Gabriel. Uh, my next question is to Jasper. Um, your recent work has focused on connecting AIS data uh, with uh, trade statistics, sort of with using modeled or models and some assumption and derives trade statistics from uh, AIS data. Uh, can you shed some light on the challenges uh, in this approach as well as how you overcome uh, how you overcome this and then how this can be institutionalized uh, as we move forward? Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you, Joseph. And, and thank you for, for inviting me to uh, to be on this panel. So as you mentioned, the, the most recent and most detailed work that, that I did with um, some colleagues at the IMF was looking at trade activity in for small Pacific islands. And, and you kind of already uh, mentioned why this is important for these islands, because if you if you go to, to them and you look at the official trade statistics, usually there's a lack of, let's say, a year or sometimes even two years for some Pacific islands. And, and we came up with the idea during, during COVID when tourism sector was really collapsing and there was really no insight what was actually going on. So we asked ourselves the question, can we use AES to come up with, with meaningful trade statistics um, on a, on a sub-annual level for, for these um, islands? And the, the sort of nice thing about this and, and the case study for the Pacific Islands is that they're almost um, fully reliant on imports for economic activity, which means that you're not just tracking trade activity, you're actually tracking the pulse of the whole economy of these islands, which is a real added benefit. So from we kind of follow the same approach as, as uh, was shared in the presentation, but took it one step further in which we sort of used the dynamic information in the vessel messages to also track changes in the draft. So how full a vessel was when it entered and when it left the port. And we should have used this information to better understand where whether a vessel may be importing or exporting and also how much it would have imported or exported. Um, and the second reason for using Pacific Islands is that it was an ideal starting point to test this methodology because uh, well, as I said, almost all the imports are maritime, so we don't really have to worry about air or, or land transport. And there's only a limited number of vessels that arrive at these islands every week. So we could really sort of trace every individual vessel and see um, whether we captured everything. Uh, but also it was really important that every um, sort of trade that we estimated from a single vessel was correct because you can imagine that you know one mistake can really sort of skew your monthly statistics already and i have to say the the insight here is that it, it worked quite well um we could really provide meaningful um, statistics for these small islands but i also wanted to highlight a couple of sort of cautions here and this is kind of based on the, the work that, that I did with the IMF, but also my own research where I used AES statistics to derive trade uh, across ports globally, uh, is that AES data is very good for identifying trends or turning points, but the absolute values that you derive from it beyond vessel statistics is you really have to take it with a grain of salt. It's 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 still, in you know, the, the potential for error is still quite big. The other th thing is that even if you have a sort of methodology that works well for some contexts, it might not be equally representative in other contexts. And that is for, for several reasons, including sort of the accuracy of, of AES data across geographies. Um, and it still remains quite hard to say something uh, when there's large transshipments going on in, in some of the, the big the big board. So, yeah, I think these are the always the the three things that are kept have to be kept in mind when using AES data, and also trying to emphasize that domain expertise is still really needed when you start applying it, and it's just not just a, a big data exercise. Uh, thank you, Jasper. Uh, so, if I may ask a follow up question to you, uh, given that. Uh, you are already using uh, AIS data to monitor trade, uh, uh, certainly using a model and uh, some assumptions. Is it possible to combine AIS data with another data sources or other data sources to make it 
make the estimates data driven rather than model or assumption driven yeah absolutely and i think uh, if i think about sort of the the way ahead is that if your if if your purpose is tracking trade activity or maritime trade obviously aes data in itself is a good data source if your objective is to provide high frequency economic indicators i think the way forward is to combine it with other high frequency data such as um, transaction data or nightlight data that sort of provide a complementary uh, provide complementary indicators of what's going on in different parts of the economy and and i believe and i haven't tested it and i haven't seen it but that combining or fusing these different data sources provides you with a more accurate indicator than than any of these sources um um in 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 its own right um, and i think the second point for improving aas um, or maritime trade statistics is combining it with customs data i think this is the sort of the way ahead really trying to understand why like what's going on in in very much detail knowing that custom data is not publicly available everywhere but but really trying to see how you can combine customs data with AES data uh, to to also do corrections in your your AES methodologies. Uh, thank you, uh, Jasper. And uh, let me pick on something that you already mentioned and uh, ask Gabriel the question. Uh, uh, Jasper mentioned that the. Uh, a methodology and approach that is applicable for one situation or one location may not be applicable to uh, other uh, situations. So I'm, I'm wondering, given your work on the passageways, uh, a given approach, uh, does it have to be, uh, a, to, for a given approach to be applied to a situation, does the situation or a passageway have to conform to certain definitions or can it be applied to uh, you know, the passageways uh, that are like varied. Uh, for example, we, you know, we have canals like Swiss Canal and Panama Canal, which are sort of pretty similar, but then we also have uh, other passageways which are not really uh, uh, canals, but are more like straits. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, that's a very, very interesting question. And uh, these are some of the problems that we have faced so far. So naturally, um, we have to base ourselves on the uh, knowledge from those operating those canals, right? Such as to make the assumption that allow us to estimate the statistics that we want from the canals. So the, the short answer on that is like, uh, it's very difficult to generalize a methodology that uh, derives information from one canal into the other. So as what uh, Jasper mentioned, um, knowledge, uh, domain knowledge is very important such as to streamline a good method such as to catch the most of the information that the AS could be derived from. Uh, thank you, uh, Gabriel. Uh, my next question is to uh, Nili. Uh, given your uh, experience working with uh, you know, traditional data, official statistics, and now delving into uh, non-traditional data or innovative data like AIS, um, do you foresee that this being mainstreamed uh, in the new future? Uh, and, and so, Because... When we look at the countries that we work in, uh, uh, it is a, quite a challenge uh, to gather traditional data. So we are thinking, hoping that uh, we could sort of leapfrog to using uh, innovative data to produce innovative statistics. So what are your thoughts and uh, experience and thoughts in this? Thank you so much. I absolutely believe that these new um, data sources and especially big data will be implemented in official statistics because um, think about it. The COVID-19 pandemic showed that it's really important for central statistics offices to inform users, policymakers, stakeholders. But what if we cannot produce timely statistics? Then we lose relevance. And that is really crucial for official statistics offices to not lose relevance. So we always have to think about a trade-off um, between quality and timeliness. 
And we need to think about the definition of official statistics. And at the moment, we give the stamp of official statistics to the values that we publish in the end. And I think JSPA made a really good point just now, and we have to think about it moving forward. What do we validate and what is official statistics? Because absolutely, the um, final value, we can, for example, say we had 300 ships arriving in Dublin port based on the administrative data. To replicate this value with IS data is impossible. We will never get exactly the same value, but we can see the same trend. So we have to ask ourselves, is that good enough? So can we validate our production line and say, this is official, and it still gives us enough insight into something very important showing a trend over time. And then you can still use the administrative data to show the official value um, a few months later. So I think we're really going to change what we um, define as official um, within central statistic offices. And we have to much more think about validating the process to arrive to a value. And yes, definitely, I believe that we will use big data going forward because we have to stay relevant. And that is a really a key and a key challenge of central statistics offices. Uh, thank you, uh, Nelly. Uh, my next question is for Justin. Um, given uh, what we have attempted to do uh, with AIS data uh, in the time uh, frame we had to publish this report, um, what are your suggestions on uh, what we could do uh, moving forward in terms of improving the methodology or thinking um, uh, differently about approaching uh, uh, research based on AIS data. And uh, you can talk from your own experience uh, with AIS data. Yeah, I suppose that speaks very much to what I was saying earlier about thinking about your, 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 your data reduction um, phase, but also being able to actually visualize the results or give sort of the, the, the sort of uh, an understanding of what these results actually um, mean for, for users because it's all very well having a table. Can, can I just maybe I'll add to share a screen for just a couple of minutes? So, what we're looking at here is actually what is the output of our um, AIS uh, results for Ireland, and we're just looking at this for um, you know, we were looking at this as firstly as the Dublin context. So, what we are looking at here is this is giving us our results and that we can actually visualize these um, on, a, on a basis and if we wanted to maybe we could look at uh, publishing these as a web app but probably not the situation but being able to sort of give users an understanding of where the results come from so what you're looking at here is the um, definition of our boundary and where the results are coming from um, why we how we've defined our clusters. Um, we've got a, a temporary movement here of a ship which stopped here, had an operational movement to here, but it was still essentially the same stop ship event. Um, you can also turn this result around and look at it as a sort of a global sense. It says, where does a ship go once it is, um, you know, once you have a ship that you're interested in, where has it gone for, for a given year? So this is just looking at where this ship has gone for a given year. Um, it also gives you some sort of insight as to where, what happens. Uh, you've got the Keel Canal here, so there's some sort of operational information you can derive from that, uh, the ship transiting through canals. So I suppose what you probably could be looking at is sort of once you've got some basic data, is how can you extend it? How can you turn that around? How can you move that onto sort of, you know, your ship visits? So for the small Pacific Islands, your interest is, okay, given that this ship visited here, where's it come from? Where's it gone to? Um, so you're sort of moving on to the next level of, of that sort of information. So if your first step is actually getting something out of AIS, but once you start getting to a situation where you've got some sort of information, you can start looking at how you can extend that out to, to, to sort of use that to drive out more and um, sort of start thinking about how, given you've got port visits, where does the ship come from? Where does the ship go to? Which sort of brings on your trade dependency and sort of what are the network effects of of, of your port visits? So yeah, yes, you have a ship visiting here. Where, where is it connected to and from? And where do they sort of the, the onward connections? Uh, thank you. Um, 
just it. Uh, so another question is, um, can uh, AIS data help in addressing uh, trade data asymmetries that we see with traditional data? Uh, anybody can uh, answer this question. Sorry, could you repeat that question? Yeah, uh, can AIS data be used to address uh, the asymmetry, uh, asymmetries that we see in trade data? Uh, because uh, often what we see is the import uh, um, data or trade data related to one country or like between a set of countries is, is uh, there's differences between a country's export and another country's import from the same country. Um, Justin, can I take it? Yep. All right. So yes, I, I do. I do believe there's some sort of uh, democratization of uh, statistics with the uh, methods based on AS data. AS data comes uh, in a uniform form, in a standardized way, and could be implemented on any place in the world. So for me, it does remove uh, some of the asymmetry that we see from traditional statistics uh, or official statistics offices. So the case of Jesper, uh, I think that's uh, very valuable. Uh, places that have information years after their occurrences could now be uh, leveraged with the Zeta, uh, producing comparable information to places, uh, other places where actually could historical could have had the uh, information uh, closer to real time. So yes, I do believe AS poses some uh, sort of uh, democratization on the availability of statistics between uh, countries. Uh, thank you, uh, Gabriel. Uh, another question uh, we have is related to the quality of AIS data. So what could affect the accuracy of AIS data in uh, some geographies or even globally? Because we did see uh, in our own uh, research some data quality issues uh, related to AIS data. So I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you you have had similar experiences with AIS data and uh, what could be done to address it? Uh, maybe I can just start with Justin. Yeah, I suppose um, because you know, our area of interest is Ireland and we're interested in ports. So one of the issues that we probably won't have is the incidence of AIS spoofing because if you were going to be spoofing or if you're going to be a bad actor, you wouldn't be doing that in port because that's just going to raise um, issues where someone goes, well, that ship, AIS is staying at somewhere else. Um, so it would depend on your scope and sort of thinking about also what are the bad actors. So you 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 would start with thinking, okay, I, an ideal situation where you've got or oh, everyone's acting as a good actor, and what sort of what could be expected to see. And then sort of like if you're doing something like fishing monitoring, you would have to start thinking about how could you start doing getting onto more intelligence work as we're trying to identify what would a bad actor look like and how would you act if you were trying to spoof the system and how could you try and detect that. So um, that goes down to the situation where you're dealing with any sort of bad data um, is the lie requires much more effort to maintain than the truth. So you would start looking at how could you sort of um, detect where a lie is, is taking place and you would sort of be using some sort of trends of, you know, okay, is there any jumps uh, of position or something like that to start thinking about how you could detect bad actors. But, you know, unfortunately, well, fortunately for us, in our case, that's not really an issue because it's a well-regulated country. Um, your act, any bad actors wouldn't be doing it in, in our ports because, again, that would just raise questions and, and bring um, law enforcement or intelligence services to be start looking at them. So, you know, it would depend on your use case, but always be thinking about how could I detect and you know what what would what would bad data look like and how could I find it? Oh, thanks, Justin. Uh, Nelly, do you have any thoughts on this? Thank you so much. Um, so I really much can echo what um, Justin says, but it is. Um, very important to keep in mind that you're very careful with your methodology and how you calculate a stop chipped event, because we've seen the main difference between IES data and official statistics is that we are overcounting. And um, the IES data source is much richer than our official data source. Um, so this has to be kept in mind. And you have to really be careful how do you count an arrival or a stop chipped 
Do you have to be at Anchor? For how long do you have to be at Anchor? What is your area of interest? And Ed showed that in the presentation as well, it is very important to define your area of interest. But always also be cautious about what you compare your data to and what are you benchmarking it to. Not necessarily your admin data as a true source either. So always questioning what are you comparing your work to and are you confident in the data you're benchmarking against? Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Uh, the next question is directly to uh, Jasper. Uh, it's from the chat. Uh, so how can the AIS data in combination with other relevant data be used to optimize logistics and also to reduce emission as like uh, an application? Yeah, I think uh, I think that that's that's a very good very good point. I think it's first of all, um, in a sense, logistics companies or or maritime carriers. They this is one of the things they already do, right? They are they are optimizing their um, they're optimizing um, their their logistics or their their um, transport patterns all the time. I think what the AES data gives you is actually very granular information on vessel movements um, in in on a on a sub every second every minute you can see the the speed you can do a lot of well additional work complementary work to then also derive um, almost CO two emissions in in near real time as well and I think that's a, a really great opportunity to to understand the entire journey from it leaving a port to its next destination. Um, where the main uh, emissions are taking place, why it's taking place, and if there are ways to to reduce this. Is this um, about indeed some of these these choke points, these canals that are congested and and vessels just coming there at normal speed and then waiting there? Um, you know, these are all kind of insights that that over the long term, I think this this data really needs to be embedded in their decision making can really sort of start help to optimize um some of the um some of the emissions. And it's it's interesting in a sense because if you if you look at the the IMO uh, targets, uh, new CO2 targets and the ways that they propose to achieve that on the one hand it's about decarbonizing the the fuels but also about operational and energy efficiencies. And I think on that second point, the AES data is really can play a critical role to, um, to at least from the logistics side, uh, reduce the emissions. Thank you, Jasper. I think we have quite a time, but just one question. Uh, uh, let me ask Gabriel. Now, uh, we have been using um, AIS data for assessing the trade related to islands, small island nations, and so on. Now, this particular question is, I think, coming from somebody uh, in Indonesia. Um, how can this data be used for a large country like Indonesia, which has which is lot many ports, but again, huge landmass? Well, interesting, interesting question, and I, I I do believe it poses an interesting problem as well. Uh, the, the benefits of this is like uh, you have uh, worldwide coverage. Um, what you could do is like have a margin around uh, all the islands in Indonesia and uh, implementing uh, methods such as the one they uh, introduced by Kieran for recogni recognizing uh, port polygons dynamically. Uh, in that way, you can pinpoint vessels coming in and vessels coming out and with the methodologies from the report as well, identify connections within islands and from island to uh, to to places out of Indonesia, so I do believe it's like an interesting problem. Uh, it could be scale scalable within AIS itself, and I do believe there's like an in, an an improvement of uh, a pot potential for improvement of statistics generation from AIS, particularly on those places where have many islands uh, covering the, the the territory. All right, uh, thank you very much, Jasper, and that, that's all the time we have for this webinar. And I would like to thank our presenters as well as our uh, expert panelists uh, whose expertise we will be relying on uh, as we move forward with this work. Uh, before we end the webinar, I would like to give you some information about our next webinar, which will take place on the 9th of November uh, between 9.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Manila time. Uh, it will be on the topic, uh, the title of the webinar is uh, How to Stop automotive battery 
uh, recycling from poisoning our children. Uh, it will be led by our uh, chief economist, uh, Dr. Albert Park. Uh, should be an interesting uh, conversation. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to uh, your comments and questions and uh, working with you as well. Thank you very much. Bye.